All right, today we have so much to talk about. So um, definitely kind of a jam packed day. I'm going to start with talking about the difference between a confidence interval and a prediction interval in the context in the context of re regression. Um, kind of a you know slight difference but very important difference because you really need to know when to use each and then um, we're going to dive into exploring some of that ANOVA table that um, comes with some of the regression output and kind of talking about some of those other numbers that you get in the output um, so like I said today's definitely a day that we've got a lot of detail to cram in um, so uh, make sure that if you do have any questions after the end of this that you ask in the discussion boards. All right, I'm going to use an example that we've seen before. This is uh, BAC, so blood alcohol content, and beers consumed. So Ohio State University randomly assigned a number of cans of beer that student volunteers who were of e legal age uh, to drink. 30 minutes later, police officers measured their blood alcohol content uh, and they want to, you know, really investigate the relationship between how much beer do you consume and what your related uh, blood alcohol content would be, you know, after the, the certain number of beers. And so we have seen in an earlier video that the conditions for simple linear reg regression have been met. We've got a real straight line relationship, real um, linear trend. The residuals seem to be fairly constant. And uh, in a normal probability plot, they seem pretty normal. So we'll go ahead and move forward you know, kind of uh, still under this assumption that the conditions are reasonably met, no need for any transformations. And so at that point, once you decide that, yeah, the conditions have been met, you have decide on your model, transformations or no transformations, then you get the output. And so this is the output that we were given. And when you're asked to write the regression equation, what you need from the table are these two numbers. So the goal is to write out the regression equation. So that's y hat equals. Then the first number that you list is the intercept. So negative 0 0.0127 plus 0.01796x. Since I'm using y hat and x, I do want to make sure that we know what it is that I'm talking about. So y hat would be the predicted blood alcohol content and x is number of beers consumed okay there we have it well uh, now that we have um, you know the regression equation you know one question that I would have is you know is number of beers a significant predictor of blood alcohol content I think Logically, we would say yes, that's how alcohol gets into your blood in the first place. Um, but doing a t-test on the slope real quick, I can see that the t-statistic for this explanatory variable is pretty large. The p-value is super small. So we would be able to conclude that yes, number of beers consumed is absolutely a significant predictor of BAC. And so then, you know, once we have that information, I can start asking questions about predicted values. All right, so, you know, let's do a little hypothetical here. Pre, you know, pretend that you just got out of, you know, class. You unwind, maybe go down to downward dog. You're thinking meeting some buddies there. It's a Friday night or Friday afternoon, and you have a couple of beers. All right, let's say you have three beers that you decide to consume. Well... Thank goodness you just walked out of class, right? Where we have a model for this kind of stuff. Uh, we talked about the predicting BAC levels. Uh, you have a regression model that you can use. Um, so as you're, you know, deep in conversation with your buddies, you bust out your 352 notes. And then you are able to use the model to predict what your BAC is going to be um, after, uh, after consuming these three beers.
So what is your predicted BAC? Now, the you know kind of funny point I'm trying to make here is that you are an individual. And so what you're trying to do is predict what the BAC will be for an individual person. Uh, using the regression model, we have y hat equals negative 0 0.0127 plus, and then we have the value of the slope, 1796, input three beers, and then out comes a predicted value of 0 0.0412. All right, so that is our predicted BAC, or, you know, your predicted BAC. Now, of course, we don't expect your BAC to be exactly that, right? I mean, you're an individual, and this is a model that's kind of based on what happens on average. And so, um, of course, we would take this as a pretty good estimate, but having a range of values that you could fall in, that's probably more realistic, right? And if we're going to create this kind of range or interval, we need to have some level of confidence associated with it. Well, um, with all of that being said, a prediction interval is for a single response. That's you. That's a, you know, one person, you know, we're predicting what's happening for one future observation and we're using this model to make that prediction. That's the really key, you know, that's the key that you need to focus on when deciding what to do, a prediction interval versus a confidence interval. And I'll get into that here in just a moment. So using some R coding, um, we can use the predict function. And so BACLM, that's just the linear model, the name that I used to create my linear model. The data frame was for my variable beers equaling three. And then I added to this another argument, a little comma, and I just said interval equals, and then inside double quotes, I typed out prediction. So what I'm getting in this R output is a prediction interval. And again, focusing on the fact that's for one single response. And so in this case, what in the output, what we get is a fit, a lower bound, and an upper bound or upper um upper range. And so uh, the word fit, all that is, it is the y hat, the predicted value. Okay. So using the regression equation, that's how we get the fit. Um, but then the output will give you the lower bound and the upper bound. So to interpret this, uh, what I would say is that with 95% confidence, the BAC for an individual consuming three beers, okay, that's you, uh, is estimated to be less than 0 0.087. Now, the one thing here to kind of keep in mind is that in the context of our problem, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to have a negative BAC, right? It just, you know, it doesn't make sense in the context of um, what the data is. Now, these lower bounds and upper bounds are based on some estimates and, and you know, some numbers. So um, when it doesn't make sense for our BAC to be negative, I would essentially just, you know, stop that at zero. So in this case, I used the language, you know, our BAC is estimated to be less than 0 0.087 or I could have said between zero and 0 0.087. So I just, you know, kind of wrote that in a way that it made sense, right? It's going to be less than 0 0.087 um, because we understand it can't be anything negative, of course. Okay, so that is a prediction interval. Well, now, what if, let's say you got to thinking, okay, well, how about everybody that only drinks three beers? What would be the average BAC for all of those individuals? So the, the switch in our question is before we were talking about just a single person, but now we're talking about all individuals who drink three beers. All right, so what would be the predicted mean BAC for all of those individuals? Well, it turns out, we're still using the same regression model. Um, the model didn't change, and so it's going to be the same, right? So uh, before, when we used the regression equation, we found a predicted value of 0 0.0427. 
four, one, two. All right, so the prediction value isn't going to change depending on if I'm thinking this is a prediction for an individual or if it's a prediction for all individuals that drink three beers. The thing that changes is the uh, width of the interval, right? And then granted, we're using R. I'm not going to show you the formulas on how to hand calculate these intervals, right? So you're always going to get kind of some output, but that is kind of the main difference. So the value in number five, that's just an estimate, you know, using our regression equation. And um, again, what you need to think about is the fact that this is a confidence interval for the mean response, not just a single individual's response. All right, so I wanted to point out that when you are in our studio and you, you know, you know that your interval needs to be a confidence interval because you're really kind of thinking about the mean BAC for all individuals who consume three beers, you're using the same predict function. I still have my linear model. Um, the data frame is three beers, but the thing that changes is inside these double quotes, I have confidence, that word confidence. So what it does is it adjusts the standard error that it uses and the interval then becomes a little bit different. And so our fit or our predicted value stays the same, but the lower bound and the upper bound do change just a little bit. So to interpret this 95% confidence interval for the mean BAC, what I would say is that with 95% confidence, the mean BAC for all individuals consuming three beers is estimated to be between 0 0.027 and 0 0.056. Okay, so um, the, the real take home message here is that, you know, we have this linear model um, and I can use it in a couple different ways. I could really focus on the relationship between the two variables and talk about the slope and how that, you know, changes. And then I also have the ability to use this, this model to make predictions, right, for future individuals. All right, next where we're headed is the analysis of variance table. All right, so to get started with that, uh, one thing I want to you know, kind of use uh, to point this relationship out is just a super simple handful of points. And so this is just some generic data. You know, we've got X's and Y's. And, um, you know, I've created a, a bit of a scatter plot using these, you know, numbers. You can bring some context to it if you want, but essentially, you know, this represents, or what I want to point out is all the different sources of variation that we have in our data or the way that we sort of look at the variation. So when I'm thinking about total variation, I'm really focusing about the variation in my response. So all of those Y values. So if I'm thinking about this, um, as far as these numbers go, these numbers are different. I want to try and model why those are so different, okay? And so the total variation in my data, the way we define that total variation is I think about, well, what is the average Y number? So if I take those values that I circled on the last slide and I just found the good old fashioned average, I would get 7.2. Okay, so from 7.2, how far off are all of these points? And so if you, if you can visualize total variation as all of these vertical distances from the point to this grand mean. Right, so when there's a Y with a line over it and there's no subscript, we would call that the grand mean the mean of all the y's. That's the total variation. Now, I can actually split that total variation up into two different sections, right? This is partitioning the total variation. So what the regression line does is it tries to kind of explain some of that total variation. So what I've got here is a couple of different points. Um, we've got the y bar line, that's not a bar. That's the Y bar. 
um, that 7.2 that you saw on the last slide. And then this right here, that black solid line, that is our regression line. So we'll just call that the least squares regression line, okay? So um, the first part is the part of the total variation. Maybe I might move that over here. The part of the total variation that is explained by the regression model. And so remember that this red, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it's this red vertical line. And we're only going to focus on this one point for the moment. This is the total variation. And you can see that it's split up into two different sections. So from this Y bar all the way up to the Y hat for this ith observation, that piece <clears throat> is essentially what the regression line is explaining. But there's that piece that's left over. So that piece that is left over is from the point Y down to the predicted value. So we can even call this yi because we have lots of y's. The little subscript i just indicates that it's the ith observation. So it could be the first or the second or the third, you know, depending on what point you're actually paying attention to. And so this part that is left unexplained, as a statistician, I, I really want to kind of know what, what's going on with those. And that's why we have focused on those before. I didn't really think of it as, as the part of the model or the part of the variation that the model is not explaining, but those are residuals, right? It's the y minus y hat. Well, I'm just using a little subscript i down below to indicate that it's the ith observation. And in fact, I probably should have been doing it the whole time, but we'll go ahead and include that here, okay? All right, so to kind of summarize what we have, if I think of an individual point, is the total variation is the part from the point to the y bar, the average for all the y's. And that total, which here is a solid black line, can be split up into two different pieces. The piece that the model is explaining, that's from the predicted value to this y bar line. And then there's the piece that's left over. It's called the error, or we call it the residual. Okay, and we've been looking at residuals. We make plots about residuals. We think about how those residuals are distributed. Um, and so those residuals, or the error, is really something that's important. Um, and that's why we do end up giving some focus to it. Okay, so. One of the reasons why we are doing all of this, looking at where is all of this variation, is because I want a model that does a really good job of explaining the variation in the response. And so I have to be able to quantify that with some of these values. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm just giving you some formulas. I will be honest and say, you're probably not ever gonna have to hand calculate these. But um, what I did is, is I explained everything focusing on this one single point. Well, in order to see how the model is doing overall, I need to kind of find these same values for all the points in my data set, okay? So we'll take this and essentially just add everything up for each piece of the variation I'm focusing on. So the total variation for all points in the model is taking that distance right, that, that vertical distance. And because sometimes those distances are negative, that would cancel out all those positive differences. Uh, well, one way we just sort of fix that is to square all of those uh, differences, right? So then I don't have to worry about any kinds of negatives. So when I sum up all of those squared differences for the total variation, I get SST sum of squares total. And then we'll do that for those other two pieces that make up the total variation. So we have the sum of squares for the model. And again, we know that the model will explain the difference between the predicted value and the mean for all those y's. We just square all of those differences up 
and then add them all together. So we'll call that SSM. And then SSE is essentially all of the um, residuals squaring them. Because remember, we get positive residuals and negative residuals. Well, if I just add them up, I'll get zero. So I still want a measure of those residuals. So we square everything, again, getting rid of that negative, and then add it up. And so what we'll call that is SSE. So a table, an ANOVA table, gives me a sense of where all of this variation is. All right, we've got the sums of squares column. So we have the SSM. Now up at the top, the first row in this ANOVA table, that is dedicated to our model. And right now we're talking about a regression model. And so all of the SSM stuff and the degrees of freedom for the model, that's all gonna be on the top row. Error or the residuals are always gonna be in this bottom row. Uh, well, not completely bottom, right? The, the, the second row down. And so we get SSE, we'll have degrees of freedom for the error. And then the mean square is just um, taking the SSM, so the sums of squares for the model, and dividing by degrees of freedom. So it's kind of, you know, a, a measure of how much is this model explaining relative to the degrees of freedom, which happens to be V. V, down here, I tell you, is just the number of explanatory variables. So in simple linear regression, we only have one explanatory variable, so that's going to be a one. But we're getting into multiple regression, and it might be that my regression model has five explanatory variables. Right? I very easily could have taken that BAC example from earlier, and instead of just using number of beers consumed, I could have other variables in that model as well, maybe height, uh, weight, I mean all kinds of things that might factor into it. So I could add explanatory variables to make my model even better at predicting. And so um, that is where we get our degrees of freedom for the model. Now the DFE, that is the total sample size minus the number of residu uh, excuse me the number of explanatory variables and then we'll take one more off of that so now i have the dfe degrees of freedom for the error term and if i take sse divided by degrees of freedom that's how i get the mean squares now this f statistic which i'll explain a bit later on what this means and what kind of questions can we ask that is just the ratio of the mean squares okay all right, some fun relationships in this ANOVA table. The total sums of squares is just uh, equal to the sums of squares for the model plus the sums of squares for the error term. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise because we just went through talking about the fact that I can split the total variation up into these two different pieces. Well, the degrees of freedom kind of have a similar, uh, similar relationship in that the total degrees of freedom which I didn't really look at here, that's just n minus one. That is going to be equal to the DFM plus the DFE. So if I add these two together, I should get the column total. Just like if I add these two numbers together, I'll get the total sums of squares. We don't really add up mean squares, so that's why you don't see anything here. And then F statistics kind of hanging that out there uh, to the right. All right, another thing that I wanted to give you, give uh, some attention to is R squared. Remember that R squared tells us the proportion of the total variation in the values that is being explained by the regression model. You might have heard this term before, maybe when we were first talking about uh, simple linear regression, maybe in, in your intro class. Now, R squared, that's the, you know, the percent of variation that our model is explaining. We can see that now it's just a percent or a proportion because we'll take SSM, the total sums of squares for the model, and divide it by the total. So what proportion of the variation is the model explaining? Well, I'll also throw in another idea is that if I um, 
if I'm curious about what the what proportion of the variation in our response that our model is explaining, um, I can take one minus SSE divided by SST and I get that same value. Right? So if I don't have maybe SSM, like we're actually going to see an example here pretty soon, <clears throat> maybe I only have SSE, then this is another way of still being able to calculate that R squared. All right, a couple other things that I just wanted to point out as well. So notice that um, when I'm looking at SST, Um, divided by DFT, that is actually the formula to calculate the variance for the Y values. All right, so in question five here, it's asking us how can we use the values in the analysis of variance table to calculate the variance of the residuals? Well, here, if I calculate the variance for all the Y values, um, I'm using the total right, SST, DFT. If I wanted to calculate the variance for the residuals, I could use the information in that residuals or the error row. So using the same information, I could use SSE over DFE, right, and that should give me the residuals for the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the variance for the residuals, right, or the error term. Uh, well, knowing that there's this relationship in the table, that is actually MSE. So again, I'm just kind of repeating myself a little bit um, as far as the relationships that are in the table. Now, in practice, I you know we don't talk about variance a lot. Um, usually, we'll talk about standard deviation. So there's going to be some questions that will ask you, well, what is the estimate of sigma? the standard deviation of the residuals. Well, standard deviation is just the square root of a variance. So if MSE represents the variance of the residuals, then S, which is the standard deviation of the residuals, would be the square root of MSE. Just to be super clear, this would be the square root of SSE over DFE. All right, now on to focusing on that F statistic. So before I get into there, I like to kind of motivate what in the world are we doing looking at this F statistic. So um, I'll have, you know, a question for you. All right, so, you know, if I was to ask you the question, which of the scatter plots that I've shown you here, would you feel more comfortable using the least squares regression line to get an accurate prediction? What do you think? Answer pretty obvious. Do you like this one up here? Yeah, totally, right? That one looks way better than this one over here. So if I was to use this regression line to make predictions about, you know, what's going on either for an individual or on average, gosh, the data is right there. I mean, there is almost no variation at all um, beyond or outside of the um, outside of that regression line. Like I feel my prediction would be pretty much spot on. Whereas if I was to make a prediction using this bottom uh, scatter plot. You know, my prediction again is what is happening right here at the line, but I can tell that there's a lot of variation. So my prediction, you know, certainly wouldn't be completely spot on. So top graph we like. Well, how can I quantify that? That's really sort of the key here. So if an explanatory variable is doing a really good job at explaining variation in the response, you know, what would we expect the regression model source of variation to be in relation to the error? Why? So I'm reading this question right here and what I'm trying to get you to think about in that question it is what does the SSM look like in relation to the SSE? Okay, so the SSM, I'm going to just use um, this white space down below. SSM 
Remember that is from the predicted value to the mean. Okay, so in other words, the regression line to y bar. So all of this, if I think about it, would be sort of a, a visual representation of the SSM. That is looking to be pretty large um, in relation to, or relative to, the SSE. So the SSE, remember, is from the point to the line. Okay, and the line is the y hat, right? That's our model. Well, gosh, if I look at all of those residuals, those are like nothing. Do you see these little tiny vertical lines that I'm drawing that are like almost non-existent? That is pretty small. Okay, now compare that to this other picture over here. Again, I'll think of SSM. SSM is from the line to Y bar. Notice Y bar is this vertical line that's drawn in both of these pictures. And so SSM is all of these, right? From the line to the Y bar. So that seems to be pretty small relative to SSE. So SSE are the residuals. The residuals are all of the vertical distances from the point to the line. So all of these are adding up into the SSE, which seems to be pretty large in comparison to all of these little tiny things that I would have to add up. So considering that I can, you know, answer that previous question, what line do you think is doing a better job? Well, certainly this one over here on the left. Well, what would I be, you know, looking at as far as numbers are concerned? The relationship of SSM over SSE. One problem, though, that we have is that, you know, if I, if I use SSM only, um, you know, models that have more explanatory variables are going to have larger SSMs, right? Because we just keep adding up all of these squared um, differences, uh, not to mention the more points that I have, the more stuff that I'm adding together. So what we need to do is think of uh, the F statistic as a ratio of the mean squares. Now, mean squares, remember, is just sums of squares over degrees of freedom. So if SSM is here on the top, I'm sorry, mean squares for the model is up on top. Well, mean squares is just, you know, this ratio here. And then if the error term is down on the bottom, SSE over D. FE, that's really what the mean squares error is. So another way for us to determine, you know, if there's any evidence to suggest that our explanatory variable is a significant predictor, remember how we used to do in simple linear regression that t-test on the slope? Well, I could actually answer that same question with an f-test. Yeah. Actually, I can do the same thing. So for a F-test in simple linear regression, I am going to point that out. We haven't quite talked about multiple regression exactly, but we're getting there. You know, I could, I could form the null and alternative by considering, you know, the slope. In uh, a situation where our explanatory variable does not help explain the variation in the response, well then the slope would be zero. So our regression line is doing nothing at helping to explain the variation in y. It's a flat line. Now if our regression equation uh, or our um, explanatory variable does help with um, explaining the variation in the response, well then I would expect to see something like this. In other words, there to be some type of slope. Well, using the f-statistic, I can actually answer that question. So the way that this f-statistic goes is that a large f-statistic, 
results in smaller p-values, so in other words, I can reject the null hypothesis. So what we would be looking for is large f statistics in order for us to say, yes, I do have a significant predictor. F statistics actually have two degrees of freedom. They have a numerator degrees of freedom, which is just the number of explanatory variables, which in the table is DFM. And then there is a denominator degrees of freedom, which is equal to N minus number of explanatory variables minus one, and that is just DFE. The reason why they're called numerator and denominator degrees of freedom, well, it's because in the numerator, we have MSM, which if I expand that out, is just SSM over DFM. So here's our numerator degrees of freedom and then our denominator degrees of freedom. That's the way we look at it. Okay, so let's go through an example of what this might look like, um, you know, maybe in, an, in a test situation. Okay, so I have data on measurements of the girth and the volume of 31 um, black cherry trees felled. Note that the girth is the diameter of the tree um, measured at six feet, no, four feet, six inches above the ground. So that is where they took this girth measurement. So what we're going to do is use girth as an explanatory variable for um, volume. So volume is our y. And we're going to see if it's a significant predictor using the ANOVA from our studio, ANOVA output. So again, I could answer this question doing a t-test on the slope, but right now I'm going to answer that question with an F test, okay? All right, so state the null and alternative. Um, the null hypothesis here would be that the girth of a felled black cherry tree does not help explain the variation in the volume. So in other words, I would say in this null hypothesis that um, we don't have any relationship between X and Y, whereas the alternative hypothesis would be that yes, we do have a relationship. Girth of a black cherry tree does actually help explain the variation in our response, which is volume. So what tests can we use? Well, we could do a t-test on the slope, right? This is stuff that we've covered before. You can also do an f-test. Fun fact that you can take to your dinner party, check this out. If I was to take the t-statistic, square it, that's actually the f-statistic. What? Is your mind just completely blown? Uh, keep in mind that's only true in simple linear regression. Once we get into multiple regression, there's lots of t-statistics, so the relationship isn't true. But simple linear regression, we only have the one. So we've got that going on. Well, shoot. Um, we were going to use the ANOVA table to try and answer this, but it uh, looks like... Uh, <laughs> These emojis sort of took over, and there is no F statistic that I can find here. Things that I do still see, right, that the emojis have not covered up, is the standard, residual standard error. Okay, so that's going to be a number we might need. We have degrees of freedom. We have multiple R squared, so this is the R squared number. Okay, so we'll take that. Adjusted R squared is something we're not really going to pay attention to so much in this class. Now, I could already see that the F statistic has a super small p-value. Super small p-value. These two are going to be the same. So I already know what the p-value is, but um, chances are I would totally ask you to complete the ANOVA table. Now, this is the regression output that you're used to that we've seen this a few times. Well, now if I take that model, I just called it tree LM when I created it. So notice tree LM is just LM, that's our linear model function. And I'm taking volume as my response, girth as my explanatory variable, and then the data um, is just trees. That's the name that I gave the data set. So now if I use the ANOVA function, I get the analysis of variance table.
and we have degrees of freedom. That actually shows up first. I think in the table that I gave you, I flip-flopped them. We have a column for sums of squares. We have a column for mean squares. Then there's that F value. Okay, so we need to fill that in based on the information that I still see. Okay, so here we are. All right, so one piece of advice I have when it comes to filling in this ANOVA table is I like to start with the degrees of freedom. Uh, oops, Ooh, wrong way. There we go. Start with the degrees of freedom. The reason why is I think they're just the easiest to kind of nail down. And so over here, I'll start writing some notes. Um, degrees of freedom for the model. That is equal to number of explanatory variables and in simple linear regression we only have one right we only have in this case girth and so degrees of freedom for the model is one degrees of freedom for the error term that is equal to n minus number of explanatory variables minus one. And so in the data set we have 31 trees minus one explanatory variable minus one more and so we get 29 there. And so we have degrees of freedom total that should be equal to degrees of freedom for the model plus degrees of freedom error and so 1 plus 29 equals 30. I know that's not rocket science, but I like to be thorough so that when you are writing down notes, you have all of the relationships. Okay, so here's our degrees of freedom. I think the easiest to nail down. Next, um, one thing that I might do is remind you that we have our uh, the residual standard error. So residual standard error. That was a number that was given to us in the previous slide, so I'm going to backtrack. This is what I'm looking at right here. So I have to think about, well, where does that fit in this table? Remember how I said that we can use the um, square root of MSE as our estimate for the standard deviation of the residuals? Well, the residual standard error, that's what I'm talking about there. So residual standard error or in other words, the standard deviation of those residuals, or the estimate of it, that is equal to the square root of MSE. So, what I can say is that uh, MSE must be equal to residual standard error squared. Okay? So we have that number from the page prior, or the slide prior, that's 4.252. We'll square that and we get an answer of 18.0795. Okay, so I'm gonna put that where MSE goes, 18.0795. Okay, so we got that taken care of. Now I'm noticing I have mean squares and I have degrees of freedom for the error term. So let's focus on this box right here. I know that SSE, if I look at the relationships, well that's just mean squares for the error times degrees of freedom. Because remember we get MSE by taking sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom. So I'm just kind of working some algebra, solving for SSE, and that's what I end up getting. Well, I have those two numbers, so I can multiply them together. We'll take 18.0795 times degrees of freedom. And I get 524.316. All right, so now I need to figure out how do I fill in sums of squares. So notice that I kind of am starting this way, moving back. 
the one thing that I can think of that's related to sums of squares is r squared. Remember in that uh, in the notes we're told that r squared is SSM over SST. I don't have either of those. <laughs> but what I do have is SSE. So I also gave you this little fun fact that if you don't have sums of squares over, or for the model over total, well then I can take 1 minus SSE over SST. So in other words, the part that the proportion that the model is explained is one minus the part that the model is not explaining. If you have one, then you know one minus the other is what we've got. So if I take this and r squared and pretty much to solve it using algebra, solve it for SST, what I get then is an expression where SST equals SSE over 1 minus r squared. Okay, so I have SSE and I have r squared, so now I can find that number I'm looking for. So um, SSE is 524.316 divided by 1 minus, and then r squared comes from the previous slide, 0.9353. So we get 8103.8022. So I'll put that, that's SST, so that comes down here. 8103.8022. All right, so I'm going to give myself a little bit of a barrier here so that I can try and keep the notes <laughs> easy to read. Okay, so what do we have left? Uh, we've got sums of squares for the model, so that's something that I need. SSM, well, uh, if I know that the total is SSM plus SSE, well then if I take the total, subtract SSE, then I get what's left over. So SST minus SSE, and then that will equal 7579.4862. I'll just put that up in the table where it belongs. 4862. Okay, I'm starting to get these numbers filled in. Okay, and remember, mean squares is just sums of squares over degrees of freedom. So mean squares for the model is the next thing that I can see I could answer. That's SSM over DFM. Well, SSM over 1 is just the same number. And that's going to be true for simple linear regression because, again, we only have one explanatory variable. 79.8. Eight six two, and for uh, uh, in an effort to be thorough, I'm just writing down all of these values where they belong. So I know this is kind of taking a bit watching me write these numbers, but it'll be good. Finally, the last thing that we need is the F statistic. So the F statistic is equal to the mean squares model over mean squares error. And so if I take those two numbers from the table that we now have, 7579.4862 divided by MSE. All right, so again, I'm looking at these two numbers here. Those equal the F statistic. So 419.23. Holy moly, that sucker's huge. 419.23. I mean, F statistics of 7 and 8, I would consider large. 419, that's gigantic. And so that is why we saw from the output the p value is super, super small. Okay, so with all of that being said, we now have the F statistic. If I was asked what the degrees of freedom are for this F statistic, I would say 1.0. 
and 29. So sometimes the way that it's written is we have an F statistic on 1 and 29. So the numerator and denominator degrees of freedom is equal to 419.23. All right. I have, a, you know, a lot of evidence to suggest then that um, our explanatory variable is a useful, significant, or helpful predictor in um, predicting the response. So in the context of our problem, what I can say is that there is strong evidence to suggest that girth of a felled black cherry tree is a, I like this word the best, but you could say is a helpful, useful, or significant predictor of volume. All right, so the next step after here would be to get a regression model, make predictions, right? Really start describing the relationship that I have. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening. I know this is a lot of information to kind of soak in. We're going to have lots of opportunity to do some practicing as time goes on. Okay. All right. Take care.